Hail to the Chief! Welcome to Mojo Plays, and today we're taking a look at the origins of the Halo series. Before we begin, be sure to subscribe to Mojo Plays, and click on the links in the description to vote on upcoming content. Once upon a time, Bungie was made up of just two employees, Alex Serapian and Jason Jones, two university students who had independently created a few video games for Mac, including Nop, a freeware Pong clone, Operation Desert Storm, a top-down tank shooter, and the dungeon crawler Minotaur, the Labyrinths of Crete. Throughout the 1990s, they would continue to grow their brand and company size, releasing acclaimed first-person games like Pathways into Darkness and Marathon, as well as the real-time strategy game Myth the Fallen Lords. Each game laid the groundwork for what would soon be Halo, but it was the sci-fi shooter Marathon that introduced narrative concepts, mechanics, and game modes that would heavily influence their flagship game. Marathon game modes like King of the Hill and Kill the Man with the Ball would eventually become Halo's King of the Hill and Oddball, respectively. What we now know as Halo started as a three-man project, led by Jason Jones, Robert McLeese, and Marcus Leto. The game went through a number of working titles, initially being referred to as Armor, but that didn't last long for fear that the generic title wouldn't stick. Their working title then changed to Monkey Nuts, but was later changed again because Jones, understandably, apparently did not want to tell his mother that he was working on a game called Monkey Nuts. Finally, a more secure working title was determined. Blam! The game began as an engine for Bungie to use in its upcoming real-time strategy titles, but the developers and programmers soon began to create a backstory for the various environments, including the now famous Halo structure, and a third-person action game slowly began to take shape. This extremely early version of Halo was shown in secret at E3 1999, and critics had to sign non-disclosure agreements regarding their experience with the game, even though their reception was extremely positive. Bungie's world changed forever on July 21st, 1999, the day of the Macworld Conference and Expo. It was here that Steve Jobs himself introduced Jason Jones to show the world a new gaming phenomenon. The presentation was a huge success, as the graphics and gameplay were simply unbelievable for the time, wowing pretty much everyone in attendance. Not long after that enormously successful reveal, Take-Two Interactive bought a 19.9% share of Bungie, which provided both a large amount of cash to continue development and Take-Two's power of console distribution. It seemed to be a match made in heaven. Suddenly, everyone was talking about Halo, despite Bungie still trying to promote a new anime-inspired game called Oni. To satisfy their fans, their trailer at E3 2000 showed massive improvements to the game, including various new ships, the energy sword, and of course, the now iconic character of Master Chief. It was also around this time that a switch was being made from third person to first, as development of third person gameplay was actually becoming increasingly difficult for the team. Negative, hold your position. No way, Sarge, 50 meters in closing. Everything was coming up, Bungie. That is, until they had a bit of a controversy on their hands. From the very beginning, Bungie made games for the Mac, and Halo was their first game to begin development on the PC. But on June 19, 2000, it was officially announced that Microsoft had purchased Bungie, and that Halo would be a launch title for their brand new console, the Xbox. This really upset Bungie's core fanbase, and it really upset Steve Jobs too, who had just lost one of the Mac's best game developers. But as Bungie saw it, it was a win-win scenario. They received massive amounts of money, and they could experiment with the new Xbox hardware, and Microsoft received a stellar game to highlight their entry into the console market. Bungie eventually announced that the game would be coming to Mac, and made good on their promise a whole two years after the game's initial release. Suddenly, Bungie Studios found themselves moving from Chicago to Washington, and work began on porting the game to the Xbox. However, this transition soon proved tricky. The Xbox was actually a much less powerful machine, so Bungie was forced to make a lot of changes. The game was downscaled from a fully open world design to more linear missions and objectives, and the multiplayer component soon found itself on the chopping block altogether. Luckily, two developers, Hardy LaBelle and Michael Evans, worked full time on multiplayer and saved it from cancellation. Blue team has After a frankly disastrous showing at E3 2001, Complete with a choppy frame rate and game-breaking bugs due to underpowered development Xbox kits, doubt soon followed concerning both Bungie and Microsoft. Suddenly, the Xbox, which no one had played yet, was a potential joke, and both Bungie and Halo were looking like a disappointment. 
Bungie then underwent a huge amount of crunch time and were forced to both perfect the game and eliminate various unnecessary aspects like ambient life. Even the multiplayer component was in jeopardy up to two months before the game's launch, with many higher-ups believing that it would need to be cut to focus extensively on the campaign. Luckily, the crunch proved effective, and multiplayer remained in the game. Halo Combat Evolved passed certification on October 24, 2001, only two weeks from the Xbox's November 15th launch. Despite Bungie's stellar track record, doubt still lingered, particularly due to the game's disastrous E3 showing, Bungie's transition away from home computing, first-person shooters in general having a poor track record on consoles, minus a few classics, and uncertainty regarding the Xbox itself. If I'm analyzing this correctly, they believe that Halo is some kind of weapon. However, as we're sure you all know, Halo was an immediate and massive success for both Bungie and Microsoft. Critics showered the game with praise, calling it a landmark first-person shooter title, an ambitious and cinematic experience, and one of the best, if not the best, multiplayer-based video game ever made. It also broke sales records, selling 1 million units over 5 months and 5 million units by November 2005. Today, it's fondly remembered as one of the best and most important games of all time. It helped to launch the Xbox, it revolutionized the console multiplayer market, it spawned numerous successful machinima, including the still-running Red vs. Blue, and launched a franchise that has grossed over 4.6 billion as of 2015. 25% of which is made up of merchandise sales. Am I right, Marine? Sir, yes, sir! Mm -hmm. Damn right I am. While Halo wasn't originally conceived as a trilogy, Bungie and Microsoft had a major hit on their hands, so they immediately began the process of brainstorming ideas for a sequel. Since so much had been left on the cutting room floor, Bungie had a lot of leftover ideas from the original, ideas which eventually blossomed into the remaining story of subsequent games. For example, the decision was made relatively early that the game would focus on characters other than Master Chief. Bungie wanted to expand the scope of the series' world and lore, and as such, the idea of exploring the villains and playing as the Covenant spread, a decision which would become highly controversial in the not-too-distant future. Soon the great journey shall begin. Bungie's work was certainly cut out for them. By this point, the team was well aware of the Xbox's strengths and weaknesses, so they reworked the engine to better suit the capabilities of the platform. While basically building an engine from scratch is hard work, there was a major elephant in the room, Xbox Live. The service had launched in November 2002, one year after the release of Halo, and Bungie had every intention of taking full advantage of its possibilities. While the console version of the original did not have online capabilities, it did provide players with the possibility of hosting massive LAN parties, and it was these parties which influenced Bungie's development of the online portion of Halo 2. They wanted to bring the scope of LAN parties to everyone, not just to those who had a lot of friends, multiple consoles, and extra TVs. The seeds for Halo 2's online portion were planted, and the rest, as they say, is history. Halo 2 had an enormously successful showing at E3 2003. The trailer was epic and cinematic, showed off a ton of new gameplay mechanics, including dual-wielding weapons and hijacking vehicles, and the already sky-high fan expectations went through the friggin' roof. Nice. However, Bungie soon found themselves in a bit of trouble, as they realized that their ambition had outgrown their technological capabilities. The Xbox couldn't support their version of the game, and they had to redo the entire graphics engine and scrap a large chunk of the content, including most of the new Mombasa and Flood levels. Another casualty of the cuts was the game's story. Halo 2's cliffhanger ending is now legendary, but that was never the intention. Bungie planned on continuing the story, but after realizing that the story's scope exceeded what they could realistically handle, they made the decision to cut the story and end it on a cliffhanger. While they initially defended this decision in public, they knew they had disappointed not only the fans, but themselves as well. Master Chief, do you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. With only one year until launch, Halo 2 was a mess. The story had been butchered, they didn't have a working engine, and the sprawling multiplayer component was simply far too complex to be implemented within a year. Things were not looking good. What followed for Bungie was a time they did not remember fondly. They went into full panic mode and were forced to crunch. Employees worked around the clock, hygiene and personal life suffered, and depression soon set in. Despite low office morale, Halo 2 was finished and released on November 9, 2004. However, its extremely rushed development cycle was obvious. Gamers and critics alike criticized numerous issues, including the cliffhanger ending, the short campaign, glitches, and the focus on the Arbiter rather than Master Chief. Despite these relatively minor shortcomings, the game was still an enormous success. 
breaking entertainment sales records, earning critical acclaim, and revolutionizing console multiplayer. And it, with clarity and grace, has shown us the key. However, it seems as if Bungie didn't have any time to celebrate, as work immediately began on the third Halo game. Despite having ideas for the story since the development of Halo 2, the original draft of the script was considered unexceptional. It simply wasn't exciting or emotional enough. I didn't see any shape to this story. Nothing happy, nothing sad, nothing intense. B but a premature firing will destroy the arc. It's like, I think it needs more punch. Ah! Unacceptable. They decided to rework the story and implement some major deaths to give the story pathos and a sense of finality, which resulted in the deaths of some major characters, including Keys, Johnson, and Truth. They also instituted afternoon playtests to perfect the multiplayer component, and reworked various aspects of the gameplay. These included new additions like the bubble shield, and maps which were more offense versus defense rather than mirrored environments. Amid the stress stemming from high expectations, Halo 3 launched for the Xbox 360 on September 25, 2007, to high acclaim. And just like that, Bungie was out. Not wanting to be tied down to a corporation or a franchise, Bungie amicably split from Microsoft soon after the release of Halo 3. However, Microsoft retained the rights to Halo, and not wanting their major cash cow to dry up, they immediately began plans for another entry in the franchise. And Ensemble Studios, the creative team behind the Age of Empire series, was its target. Ensemble was creating a separate sci-fi strategy game for the Xbox 360 when Microsoft stepped in. Microsoft was both <laughs> admittedly wary of the profitability of a console strategy game and in need of another Halo title, so they forced Ensemble to implement elements of Halo into their creation. Ensemble scrapped the majority of the game and story they'd been carefully crafting and reworked their game. They even brought in Halo fans to provide feedback as to how they could better implement the lore, characters, and gameplay elements of the Halo franchise. Bungie wasn't exactly happy about this. Halo was their baby, and their baby was being changed in ways they had no control of. They despised the fact that their IP was being used for another game, and they hated the idea of making Halo into a real-time strategy game. They even referred to it as the whoring out of their franchise, and hostility grew between them and both Ensemble and Microsoft. Despite Bungie's objections, though, Halo Wars was released on February 26, 2009 to relatively good reviews, despite many being kind of hesitant regarding the series' move to the RTS genre. This is Spartan Group Omega. If they want war, we'll give them war. After the release of the standalone expansion, Halo 3 ODST, in September of 2009, Bungie returned to the franchise they had painstakingly built for one last hurrah. Bungie had ideas for a prequel, and while many possibilities were thrown around, they decided that the Titanic-esque story of the planet Reach raised a ton of dramatic possibilities. The new, more human-based and emotional direction for the story wasn't the only new thing Bungie was interested in trying. Everything from the ground up, including new animations, new AI, and motion capture, and redesigned various enemies, including the grunts and elites. Halo Reach, Bungie's final foray into the world of Halo, was released on September 14th, 2010, to praise and high sales, breaking franchise sales records and making 200 million on the first day alone. What have you done with my armor? Just some additions I've made. As Bungie was leaving Microsoft and the Halo franchise behind, they created a subsidiary called 343 Industries for the sole purpose of continuing the development of Halo titles. Ideas soon began circulating for a fourth Halo game, and Microsoft consulted a mythology bible to ensure that they could properly replicate the core ideas and lore behind Halo. They also consulted Frank O'Connor, who had been with Bungie since Halo 2 and stayed behind due to his love for the franchise. Development of Halo 4 soon went into full swing. 343 Industries exploded, going from roughly a dozen employees to over 300, including contractors, throughout the game's development. They also hired experienced AAA developers who didn't like the Halo franchise, as they believed that these developers would improve the experience by implementing their own ideas as to how to make the series more enjoyable to a wider audience. We're seeing just kind of the tip of the spear. Going where we want to go in the next steps is only made possible by building absolute confidence. However, a few mistakes were made along the way. The high number of employees both created bottlenecking and communication errors, which resulted in teams working on facets of the game without any idea as to what everyone else was doing. This resulted in a complete reworking of 343's management, and despite low morale, the game received positive reception at E3, which gave them the necessary confidence they needed to finish strong. Halo 4 was released on November 6, 2012, to a relatively positive reception. The range of reactions from the fanbase was as wide as it's ever been, though. 
Some thought it was the greatest Halo yet, some thought it matched the quality of its predecessors, others thought it was slightly disappointing, while others thought it was straight up bad. Despite the mixed reception, it performed well, and 343 was happy with the outcome, despite a tumultuous production. Welcome home, John. 343 Industries has since gone on to develop Halo 5 Guardians and Halo Wars 2, which was a collaboration with Creative Assembly. As for the future of the Halo franchise, well, it's probably here to stay, folks. 343's general manager, Bonnie Ross, has expressed Microsoft's desire to develop Halo titles for another 30 years. So you better get comfy. I think we're just getting started. Thanks for watching Mojo Plays. Be sure to subscribe and click on the link in the description below to check out our suggestion page and vote on what content you'd like to see us cover next.